reflecting back on ourselves, did we do the best we could? Did we look, did we ask, did we reach out before we decided to jump to something? And did we do it for the right reasons? So, you know, there are more details that I think we can fill in and maybe get to as we go down the road on this. But, but it is, the first question, what does it mean to have um, traditional Hawaiian knowledge as an asset? Go live somewhere else. You don't have that asset in most places, any place. Have the capacity to understand what people have been through in terms of living in a confined, limited ecosystem. In terms of sustainability, it is one of the most fantastic assets there are because experiences were had and knowledge was gained. So now we need to just learn the translation. And, and of course, that's not always easy either. I'm sure it's not even easy for some contemporary Hawaiians trying to figure out what was going on back then. It, we're all folks trying to do it right and trying to understand. So we have work cut out for us. But you know what? I, I may be an alarmist. I mean, the question about climate change, no, we're not doing enough. Are we going to accept it? I don't accept it yet. I just don't. We don't know what the outcome is going to be of climate change. Every time we get a new assessment, it's worse than we thought. How can we adapt when we know things continue to change? You can only adapt when you know what something is going to be. So in my book, the sustainability answer there is we should be out pushing to have people do more, more quickly. If we can go to the moon in 10 years, by God, we can have renewable energy in a lot less time than that because it's all there. Nice. But anyway, that's just me being an alarmist, I understand. But the truth is, this is a global issue. Um, some things are out of our control. But at the same time, with the assets that we have, with the commitment that we have that's traditional, there's an opportunity to be a world leader right here, no doubt in my mind. I've studied in other continents. I've been in other places. I know that we have a more advanced opportunity if we commit ourselves to what is the task, and the task is how are we going to be more sustainable in two years, in five years, now? You know, it can't be doing things that sound nice, doing things that promote something in the way of a goal but don't really tell us how to do it. We've got to design systems and processes now to start change because we don't have time. And, and, and that means going backwards maybe some way to some people, okay. Maybe we were smarter at some time before. That may be just what we have to deal with. So at any rate, don't get me worked up. My students know that. So thank Mahalo. You. Mahalo Nui. Woo. The idea that the future has an ancient heart is actually known to us. The future has an ancient heart. This is what this panel is about. We are trying to bring to you the concept that the future has an ancient heart so that we're not being nostalgic, we're being actually very practical in our combination of whole thinking, systems thinking, um, integrative thinking. These are actually um, synonyms for the mo'o. These are synonyms for continuity. These are synonyms for indigeneity. So Albie Miles, can you head in there and we're going to ask the um, questions. And then we'll, we'll have, um, Alba, if you can just start um, with the third question, what impedes transformative change at the university? And how can we do better? How can we do better, Alby? OK, gang, have a good conversation. Way to go, Tim. Mahalo nui. Is this on? All right, what, uh, what impedes transformative change at the University of Hawaii and how could we do better? I think uh, my initial response to that is we need to be developing programs that are highly interdisciplinary, if not transdisciplinary in nature. Uh, the, the problems that, that we face in contemporary society are highly complex. They're interrelated socio-ecological political phenomena like climate change. And there's no single disciplinary uh, solution to some of the complex problems that we face. So I think one, one key step is transforming the way that we do higher education programming so that it is more multidisciplinary, if not transdisciplinary. It's problem-based. And we're training people with 
real life skills to tackle real world problems while integrating our ecological and social theory into the process of learning. So we need to be reorienting rather than indulging uh, often as we do in higher education, deeply in theory, we need to reorient our model toward addressing real world problems and backfilling, if you will, theoretical understandings as we go about solving real world problems. So that's my initial initial take. OK. Well, I, um, I had a couple thoughts. And I was joking with Matt last night. Like, what impeached transformative change at the University of Hawaii? So I mean, I, I kind of grew up at UH. And I've read, you know, like who runs the university, and I've worked at the CCs. And so, from my view, I mean, a lot of it is actually quite simple, and it's just a lack of trust a lot of times, and relationships, and and like people not understanding each other. When I worked at the CCs, we worked on a six-campus collaboration, and like, oh my gosh, the CCs are really frustrated with Mano because you get seen as a second-class institution, and this like budgeting issue. I mean, it's like, can we just I don't know, everybody's of age. Can we just drink beer together? Like, I mean, like, but, but those relationships um, really hold us back. And I think what I valued when I worked at the CCs was working on a grant called the Pre-Engineering Education Collaboration. It was also known locally as IKE, Indigenous Knowledge and Engineering. Thanks, Aaron Hanai, I see people, and Bob Franco. But, like, we tried to work as a system, and it was really eye-opening and what helped as a Hawaiian was having these Hawaiian networks because I knew everybody in the NHSS at every campus and we would like help each other out and pass students back and forth and so when students took chemistry at Windward and physics at KCC and math at LCC like we all kind of kept a kept an eye on and it actually it didn't cost any more money but we worked really effectively and I think I wish anyways I'll stop talking and let somebody else answer, but I think relationships could actually help a lot. Um, let, me, let me say something that was really transformative for me. Um, when I taught in uh, high school and middle school, there was a, a young lady who came to me and said, I wish I could cut out the part of me that's Hawaiian. And I said, what causes such self-loathing? And um, that actually led me to my doctorate. But then there was another transformative time. Um, and that was when I ran out of gas driving my VW bus in Waimanalo, because I was living in Kaneohe and teaching at Kaiser. And there I am, and a Hawaiian uh, family comes up and says, hey, you look like you're in trouble. I said, yeah, I ran out of gas. And say, you know, we'll, we'll help you. I said, yeah, 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 I really appreciate it. I'll pay you for it. He said, no, 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 never mind. And um, so I went home. And then another time I was teaching at uh, a school I will not name. And I was, uh, had just come back from India. So there was a whole bunch of things that were in my mind about social class. And I'm walking my students. Of course, because I'd come back in March, they gave me the class that the teacher had quit, right? So I'm walking with them from the library back to class. And they look inside the class, and one kid says to me, hey, must be smart class, all Japs. So you know, there's these three things, plus there's a whole bunch of other stuff. And, I'm, and then you know, I wind up teaching at Kaiser. And the principal asks me, why don't you start AP chemistry? I say, yeah, sure. She says, no money, but you do it. So we did it, we won a bunch of awards, but what was always in my mind was, what is wrong with the system? And so I pulled, every, I pulled all the documents, I went through everybody's courses. And I could see that in terms of ethnicity, uh, whatever I could do as a high school teacher was not gonna work, because it was done further down. So this whole thing on institutional racism was pretty clearly there. And so that's what set my track. So how do you break that? And it's really by getting people to talk together, to respect each other, and to flatten lines of communication and to network. If we don't respect each other, it doesn't matter how I, how I dress, so you know, it's like how anybody dresses, 
whether you're they're sleeping on the beach, everybody has a story to tell, everybody has a slice of wisdom, maybe plenty slices of wisdom. And so that after, you gotta be kind of old to get above the grass. You gotta be a little bit older because, you know, then now when I carry bags out, they say, auntie, auntie, you need help to the car. You know, so you get a little bit of respect that way. <laughs> but, but uh, so I'm gonna wind it up with this. When I was about six years old, maybe 10, I climbed up in, in a mango tree that my dad, who was a, a sitar guy, had, he used to um, graph different kinds of things together. So one side was a Chinese mango and one side was Indian mango. But I was up on the side and I carved into the bark the date because I could feel time rushing past me. But I didn't know what to do with these understandings. As I got older, I actually envisioned myself rising out of a box and being able to see beyond the sides of the box. If we enable people to do that, we ask people to do that, and we ask them to communicate what they see outside the box, I think we'd be in better shape. Okay, I'm ready to tell my story. All right, it, it riffs off of Pauline's also. Um, and, it, and I think we, have, we do have the recipe for, some, for solving some of these problems. It also kind of touches on what Aurora said. The story I'm gonna tell has to do with my first, my very first faculty meeting when I came home uh, 2013 in the Department of Oceanography. And um, I get into the room and this older Howley faculty member who shall remain unnamed says, Rosie, we're so glad to have you. And I said, oh, wow, thanks, why? And he said, well, maybe you can help us figure out how to better communicate with our local students. And I was thinking, gee, I've been gone for 17 years. You've been here for 17 years. How come you're still having this problem? Um, you know, and so I think, I think one of the, the easy wins is to begin to break down the barriers between the faculty and their students, and I mean the local students, and, and understanding um, who they are. And I think that there's a lot of stereotyping among the faculty about um, the, the sh who our students are. You know, we are, at least at Manoa, we're a commuter campus. Um, you know, I hear so much from the faculty in terms of, you know, our students are distracted, when in reality, th what the reality is, is they're not distracted. They're like extraordinary multitaskers who are balancing caring for ohana and working. And I think that, that if we build that in, and I, it builds onto the last speaker's um, idea that if we have humility about our knowledge and, and if we have the willingness to learn about the historical things that happened to our people, not just the Native Hawaiians, the immigrants, the plantation workers who came here and made Hawaii their home, if we understand that, I think that we would be more willing to be more open to all of the different solutions that are in front of us. Um, so to me, I think that, that there is a lot of institutional barriers as it is, but I think that, you know, simple cultural competency as it begins with our faculty can do a lot to advance um, our ability to be open to these solutions. Yes. Mahalo. Can you come up here? I just accidentally. Hey gang, there's a lot of questions that the audience has asked and um, I accidentally just zapped it out of there. <laughs> but, um, can I add one more, Rosie? Yes, absolutely. I mean, not just um, faculty, but just all around. Like within graduate students, when I look at my peers and they want to learn, but they don't have the opportunities within administrators, yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to better understand each other and kind of reduce the animosity. Mahalo. Um, here's a question from the audience. Can uh, someone field this? How do we get our faculty and students to do more sustainability innovations and create more breakthrough businesses in Hawaii? Who wants to take that one? How to create a, an energy of movement within our, our places? Noah? I mean, I don't have a great solution, but I mean, I, you know, I've just been at Manoa for a year and a half uh, so far, and I mean, one of the things that really struck me was the, um, really low bar <laughs> a lot of professors um, want to hold for the students and want to let them get away with with uh, not pushing themselves more 
And, um, you know, that's something that I think might, might just be our department. We had a very, very, very old department um, uh, as far as who is in there. Um, and we've recently had a lot of young faculty come in and, and trying to, to shift that culture a little bit. But, um, you know, envisioning better futures for our students. You know, I feel like my department was training students to go be farm workers, you know, like that's the best you can do coming out of here. You know, this is a party surf school and, you know, we're going to find you a menial job at a, you know, and that's not the bar, the goal that as a whole the university should be setting. And obviously you can't generalize. It's every professor is an individual and, and there's some really awesome, amazing professors. Um, but I, um, I would like to see us stop, you know, um, settling, you know. Um, we should always be thinking how do we make our UH campuses the best in the nation or the world or, you know, the, the, we should be aiming for the stars and I feel like a lot of people aren't doing that. Um, mm -hmm. We're getting lazy <laughs> um, and we can't do that, you know. Um, um, I think that question is embedded in deconstructing the inevitability of capitalism because we do want farmers. We want high level, coherent, um, you know, hard working, cultural, uh, expansive farmers. We do. But how do we connect that into the system that, that, is, that doesn't make farming sustainable? So these questions that you're trying to answer are multifaceted and multi, um, multi-dimensioned. So I want to ask one more question here as we begin to close from the audience. What core values will inform our measurements? I love the, the perception of values and measurements. So each of you, what core values can inform our measurements? There we go. Have fun. <laughs> well, I'm going to go back to the word humility. Um, we think we're pretty cool. We are. But the truth is, what a fine mess we've got ourselves into in, in many ways, too. And, and I think that in our society, if I'll use that term kind of loosely, uh, and, and, it, and I'm talking from my perspective now. You understand, I don't know, I'm not embedded with some of the values that maybe some of you folks grew up with. But the, the point is, we've taken things for granted a lot. Um, we have driven to look at prosperity as something separate from the world we live in, I think, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, um, I think we've created problems ourselves. Now, this is actually the good news, though. Uh, when we talk about sustainability. If you took the people out of the world, the world would be sustainable, right? So we made the mess, but we can fix the mess without that much difficulty if we decide that's our priority. So, I, you know, it's not that simple, obviously, but it's what is um, appropriate is for us to take a look at it from a values base and to try to understand how to work a, a better, I lost, track of that primary question, but so I'm wondering, but go ahead. Yes, that's it. Thank you, Pauline. Okay. Could I talk about metaphors? Nice. When we think about, and I'm going to say these in English, okay. So I, I want you to think about three metaphors. He who dies with the most toys wins. Yep. Yep. The ocean is our refrigerator. The land is a chief, man is a servant. Three metaphors. Which one doesn't belong? <laughs> I like that game. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try and go next. Uh, my value is momona, which means abundance. And I think that we cannot be satisfied with just survival. We have to look for abundance. Um, and, and I just participated earlier this week in the National Climate Assessment Report for um, I guess it's the U.S. climate report. It's the U.S. version of the IPCC report. And um, the thing that we kept coming back to was the idea that, you know, for most ecological science, you're on this, this metrics of we want to achieve, we have this limit of this, this minimum species limit so that they're reproducible. But for practitioners, we want the amount so that we can harvest. 
And implicit within that is, of course, there's this ability of that species to, to, um, to reproduce. But it's more than that. It's, it's more momona than that for that particular male ola. Um, it's that we have enough that we can actually harvest and sustain our practice. Like there's enough that we can harvest and we can make kahili. We can gather, you know, and we can make, you know, feather capes. We can, you know, so there's enough of like the native bird population, for example. And so that's, that's what I think to me is important in this game is, is achieving aina momona and, and kai momona. Mm. I think related to um, related to the idea of what what are measures of success in mm -hmm. terms of and the values therein and the values therein. I th I think that there's a perfect opportunity to integrate uh, Hawaiian values and Hawaiian knowledge in the context of this movement toward quote unquote sustainability. And that is, if I understand it correctly, the Makahiki festivals. One of the key indicators of of success of the community it was the health of the land and the health of the people. We can measure that. We can measure that empirically. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if we're going to have measures of success beyond, beyond academic standards and students performing well, I think the, the institution, the success of the institution should be measured against to what degree are we precipitating the necessary social, political, ecological change where the health of the people and the health of the land is enhanced. Nice. Mahalo nui. Aurora? So who can throw the best party? Is that yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, um, what's on my mind is um, is maybe kuleana, and I don't know how you measure that, but like if within our students we can instill a sense of kuleana, and it's and the way I think about it is it's individual and collective responsibility. Um, if I need to translate it to modern US politics, it's civic, you know, a, a sense of understanding how the I fits in the we, um, because I think that's kind of where, like, that's an important first step. So kuleana is, or I don't know the translation, but like the civic responsibility. Okay, mahalo. Is that? Noah? Well, yeah. I mean, I was thinking along those lines of really like who or, and what do you care for? Yeah. You know, I mean, we want to grow engaged citizens who are, are out there caring for things. And like Rosie said, a lot of these students are balancing a lot of different things that they are caring for. They are caring for an ohana, you know, um, for loved ones, you know, they're caring for little sections of land and caring for communities and things like that. And again, I'm not sure how we get you know, to, to measuring those things, you know, I'm not sure how to get to the rubrics of what they are. Um, but at the same time, you also know it when you see it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So something that might be different, difficult to institutionalize, but, um, but at the same time, I think is, has an undeniable core truth to it that, that pretty much everyone knows it, you know. We know who they engaged. Mm -hmm. People who are out there doing good, and we know the ones who are who are out causing trouble, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <laughs> you know, the totally. kind of goes back to Aurora's point too of communication. You know, when you have strong, healthy communities that are communicating with each other, um, it's also really easy to identify, you yeah. know, those those um, both the people who are excelling and the ones who are who are causing trouble. Um, but yeah, how we do that in an in a institution and in the universities, uh, that's maybe for the summit to figure out. <laughs> that's the plan, everybody. Everyone take a deep breath. And I want to close with the idea that these are konohiki. Konohiki in modern times, we grew up with the idea that konohiki were our tax collectors. I always felt a little bit bummed by that idea. And then I got a little bit more knowledgeable, and then I started calling us party planners. <laughs> <laughs> I preferred that. But last week, Emilani, Dr. Emilani Case from Waimea, we had lunch together, and she said an amazing thing that she had learned that, of course, I love that hiki is can do, yeah? So kono hiki, the class of people that that joins the needs of the aina and the, the vision that maka ainana have with ali'i, get the job done with everybody. She said that the konohiki stands for 
to invite willingness. Okay, everybody? To invite willingness. That energetic field connects with what every single person has been saying for the last hour. Trust, humility, awareness, commitment. These are the, 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 the threads that have inspired me to be of service to our communities. So to invite willingness, you all said yes, willingly. And that energy then is able to amplify in its own accord. And this is why the Dalai Lama loves to come to Hawaii. <laughs> why? Because he says, gratitude is our attitude. And when you make aloha the center of your intelligence, everything changes. It really does. It really does. And that's why you have been given the Oli Mahalo on your table. We're going to learn this together again and again. And we ho ma -a -ma -a. we're going to sing our gratitude. What I learned from UPIC elder Oscar Quagley, one time we were at a science, there was only about 15, and they asked, you know, all these kupuna, please can you bless the food? And he, he's a UPIC kupuna, uahale, uahala. And he laughed and he giggled and he giggled in a kupuna kind way. And we thought we just, we, we insulted him like, uncle, please forgive us, what do we say? He says, oh my, when we prepare our food, every act is an act of beauty. Every presentation is grace. Everything is done in beauty. So we don't bless the food, the food blesses us. Isn't that beautiful? Now that's where the mo'o lives. Let our food bless us because Terry and the gang over at Ma'o really, really worked beautifully so that you can enjoy your lunch. So we are going to stand and while we thank our panel, prepare to sing the Oli Mahalo on your table. Mahalo panel. Is everyone ready? Makau kau!